Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. Very excited to be talking about owning your own genomic data. We have Dennis Grishin joining us on the show. Hello. It's my pleasure to be here. Hello. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. We are very excited to be featuring you. We're also very grateful that we ended up finding each other after we did the interview with George Church at the lab and then you were like, hey, I'm going to be in the Bay Area. We want to, yeah, we want to talk about nebula genomics, and I'm I'm very excited to be talking about this with you. It's a pivotal time in the field of of, of genomic data and and the way that we can do so many of the things the right way the first time going through it. So for those that don't know, Dennis's background, he spent two years, the last two years, as the co-founder and chief science officer at Nebula Genomics. He, which is a privacy-focused personal genomics company. Also, he's a PhD candidate at Harvard Medical School doing genomic data privacy. And a lot of interesting steps have happened to get there in, in, your, in your journey, which we're gonna get to. Dennis, teach us about your thoughts on the current state of humanity. Uh, interesting question. So um, I think we are living in an interesting time. Uh, maybe I start with kind of a historical perspective on that. Um, and you know, tell you where we are in terms of technological advancement. Um, so if you think uh, how far we ca have come and think back in you know, 18th century, you know, think about steam machine, that's when uh, I think human civilization really started to take off technologically. Um, then throughout the 19th century we had uh, uh, you know, further developments of, 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 um, of tools that have uh, you know, facilitated us to do more work more easily. Um, then chemistry had its big time in the 19th century. We figured out how you know synthesize all types of different uh, compounds and use them for different cases, whether it's you know just colors or medicine. Um, then in the early first half of the 20th century, physics had its big uh, big time with you know relativity theory, quantum mechanics, uh, unfortunately culminating in the atomic bombs. Um, then second half of the 20th century, we had you know the digital age starting with the invention of the transistor and then culminating in the internet. And I think today, uh, many people believe we are entering the age of um, biotech yes. or biology, of essentially using what we learned in the previous centuries in uh, technology that we have developed to better understand biology, specifically human biology, and uh, actually applying that to make, you know, as with all other types of technology, just our lives better, longer, uh, and you know more comfortable, um, and part of this you know biological biotech revolution is I think genomics revolution uh, that has been uh, driven by the decreasing costs of human genome sequencing, and uh, this is essentially what has enabled companies like Nebula Genomics uh, to be. Yes, yes, I love your big history perspective. Really gives the last multi multiple hundred years into a into a very you know you're following the technological impacts that have uh, that have taken place on society, and then you bring us all the way up to to this biotech explosion that's that is being talked about as a one hundred trillion dollar explosion in the twenty first century, and I'm like. Wow, uh, that's crazy that, that all of these potentials exist in, you know, in all aspects of healthcare, agriculture, all, it's everywhere the way that, um, that, it, that the impact is coming in. And so now you, you, know, you also mentioned, especially in biology, it's this Carlson curve, kind of like Moore's law, the sequencing has dropped in price so much. And I think that, that is a, that's a very, very important reason why companies like Nebula can actually exist and have the mission that they, that they do today, which I know we'll get to and unpack. Now, Dennis, when you, know, when you find yourself uh, you know, being born in Azerbaijan and going to Germany and then coming to, you actually went to Japan too, and did yeah. some work there. Brief and stint in Japan. Brief stint in Japan. <laughs> and then to the East Coast, to Harvard. You know, tell us about, you know, you as a kid and, and picking up your interests. Yeah, so um, I think uh, when I grew up, uh, I always wanted to be a scientist. So my father is a, is a chemist uh, who has been, you know, teaching at the university when I was growing up in Baku. Uh, my, my mother uh, um, got to the education of an engineer. Um, and worked briefly in that profession. So I think I've kind of very early decided that I want to kind of do science. Um, 
And then a little bit later in my life, I also realized that I want to do something translational. So not only, you know, do science in the lab and publish papers, but I actually uh, try to bring out my work out of the laboratory and to have it more impact. Um, and yeah, so uh, I, I, I grew up in Baku, as you said, and then my family moved to Germany, uh, where we went to middle school, high school, um, and received my undergrad degree from the University of Freiburg. Um, and did you know then that you wanted to do the bio in biology sp around that time? Were you figuring that out? Yeah, uh, well, uh, the, the university system in Germany is a bit different than in the US. So you have actually to decide exactly one, what you want to be even before you apply. Uh, so, you, so it's you know much more focused. Uh, just think has advantages and disadvantages. But when I was applying for for college, I uh, was applying for a specific biology program. Biology. So I wanted to be you know scientists in the field of biomedicine, generally speaking. Um, and um, during the course of my undergrad studies, um, I think I uh, wanted more than just to be a typical biologist. Uh, I increasingly got interested in technology and how we can use that technology to uh, essentially better study biology and then also apply what we learned. Um, I, I got a second degree, a second undergrad degree which in what is essentially electrical engineering. Um, and um, after that, I uh, wanted to get some experience abroad. Uh, went, went to Japan, as you mentioned before, for, for a few months. Um, worked there on some uh, microfluidics technology yes. uh, for um, essentially to enable sequencing of single cells. Um, spent a few months working on that. And microfluidics to enable sequencing of a single cell. Yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, that's uh, yeah, also an emerging, uh, emerging field. Uh, um, so far, you know, when people have been talking about sequencing, they were they had what they had in mind is just sequencing of bulk samples. So, you know, you just take like, you know, a bunch of cells like from saliva or from blood or some kind of tissue and then just sequence all of them, assuming they're all the same. Yeah. But uh, as we have found out in the last few years, that's not the case. Uh, there are differences uh, between the cells uh, on, on different levels, uh, whether it's, you know, the genome, the epigenome uh, or the transcriptome. Um, so more and more research is happening on kind of really figuring out how individual cells work uh, uh, on those different levels. Uh, and yeah, I was working, uh, well, I did some very early initial work on a device to, you know, isolate single cells to be able to sequence them. So that's what I worked on in Japan. Mm -hmm. and, and after that, um, I came to Boston uh, to the laboratory of, of, you know, Professor George Church, where I'm, I'm right now a PhD student. Uh, so back then I just came for a, for a brief internship. Um, and um, I w worked back then on, you know, CRISPR that was just, you know, just invented literally a year before. <laughs> yeah. uh, so it was an exciting time uh, and, a, and a place to be. Um, and during that time, in, a, in, in addition to doing just research in the lab, I also got involved, uh, I guess, just as a student intern with another one of his, George's startup companies. Um, and uh, really liked this experience of, you know, doing research in the lab and then translating it into a company, into yes. a product. Yes. Um, and I liked that and also generally doing research in George's lab. So I decided I want to stay here and I want to get, you know, my, my PhD degree in this laboratory and then possibly even start a company with, uh, <laughs> ideally with George at some point <laughs> yeah. later. Yeah. Um, so I applied uh, uh, to Harvard, to MIT uh, for PhD programs uh, with the goal of coming back uh, to George's lab to do my PhD thesis work. Um, so this unfortunately fortunately worked out, um, and then in 2015 I started my uh, my PhD studies in George's laboratory, yeah. um, initially working on some sequencing technology to um, essentially be able to resolve some regions of the human genome that uh, remain unsequenced to date. So we kind of tend to say, oh, we, we have sequenced the human genome, right? But it's not entirely uh, true. We actually sequenced only like 95% of it, and there's still 5% that remain missing that we're actually unable to sequence with a, with a currently available technology due to some limitations which I don't want to go into mm -hmm. but I was working on a on a way to overcome this um, and um, while working on this um, what I think I realized is that while it's kind of important to get the missing five percent what is more important to actually bring out the technology that we already have that we can use to get the 95 percent 
to be just used much more broadly. So kind of bring it out of the laboratory, out of academic research, and have more people sequence their genomes and you know share the data, uh, which and you know accomplishing that has been been George's I think life goal, uh, mission for for decades. Uh, he, he you know he helped develop this technology that brought the costs down of whole, of, of sequencing from hundreds of millions of dollars to uh, to less than one thousand dollars today. Um, but so far, it's you know really mostly used in academia. Uh, very few people uh, actually did any kind of genetic testing, especially not whole genome sequencing. And you know, I usually ask this question when I give talks: so Who of you, you know, did any kind of genetic testing, whole genome sequencing? And usually nobody and raises a hand. Yeah. Uh, so that's 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 a problem that George has been trying to solve yes. for a very long time. So I decided essentially to start a company with a goal of addressing uh, that problem. And. We asked ourselves, what are you know the issues that essentially deter people from getting sequenced, and uh, what we came to understand is that, for example, privacy concerns have yeah. become an increasing, uh, increasing issue, especially in the past few years. Um, uh, and um, it's crazy that that took the number one seat over money, that privacy took the number one seat. Yeah. yeah I, uh, so, so, you know. Money is, uh, I think, second, close second, yes, and yes. that's you know also one of the things that we're trying to address, bringing the costs close to, 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 to zero, and uh, we are already on the right trajectory because yes. the costs are coming down, but the privacy concern is actually on the opposite trajectory, <laughs> it's <actually> growing. <laughs> the more data we generate, yeah. uh, the more, you know, the more entities there are who are interested in that data, yeah. and the more concerns are, are, are coming up. Um, so we realized this is an unmet need, and there's a, there's a problem to be solved. And, uh, and we also have actually the technology to do that. Uh, so we decided to kind of bring together the field of you know, DTC, direct-to-consumer genetics, and cryptography yes. to uh, create a privacy-focused personal genomics company. Yep, yep. <laughs> the, the fact that cost is decreasing, but privacy is increasing <laughs> adds privacy com concerns, yeah, yeah. The, the, that complication is, is ironic. Um, but there's a lot of you know spiritual awakening that humanity can do to make it easier for for people to not be as at fear, for there to be less malevolence, for there to be more benevolence and and, and kindness, and therefore then the privacy decrease, the concerns decrease as well. And okay, so now as you start personal genomics company with Nebula Genomics, now. And we have we have we have slides to to bring up along the way as well, you know the big why. This is a this is a huge deal. Like you were indicating for you and George, you guys are just wanting to see this cost go from a hundred million dollars sequence down to zero, and that's because we gain so much valuable insight. So tell us more about this big why, and eradicating disease this collective intelligence that we get to have, all of these points are so interesting about yeah. the big why. Yeah, so your DNA is essentially your blueprint, right? Uh, it makes you unique. Uh, if you had an identical twin, he would be identical to you because of your DNA, because that's what you share. Um, and uh, as, as seen on this slide, uh, your, your DNA defines a lot about you. It totally, completely defines your looks, your, your physical appearance. Uh, it becomes increasingly clear that also your personality, your tastes, things like that are strongly influenced by, um, by your genetics. Um, then your health, um, things like you know, disease risks, for example, predispositions to certain types of cancers or diseases you know, like Alzheimer's. Uh, they have also a very strong uh, genetic component. Um, and you know, ancestry, uh, obviously, also something that has been you know, driving people to purchase different types of genetic tests. Um, and I think what's important to keep in mind when thinking about uh, all those different points is that we still don't understand most of the human genome. It's six billion bases, and we do not know what most of them do. Um, and to get to that point, and to get to that point that we actually do understand more of it, we yeah, need yeah. to generate more data and uh, share that data with researchers who, for example, can use that data to find new correlations between certain traits, either it can be disease predispositions, for example, and, and, and genetics. Uh, so this is an ongoing process. There are studies published essentially every day that uh, 
that shine more and more light on so far unknown parts of the human genome. So for, for an individual who gets sequenced, uh, it's not just you know a one-time thing, you get sequenced, you get some kind of report, and then you're done with it, right? That, that's not how it is. It's really a kind of you set on a journey, you start a journey. Yeah. You, get, you, get your, you get your data, you get your genome, you get your initial results, but more results are coming out every day you don't just and take the blueprint and just put it on the shelf and exactly. you're done with it. You constantly exactly. get more and more you, insight. You start to start, a, you know, essentially, I guess, a process of lifelong learning about yourself. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, that, that's what genomics essentially enables. It's uh, uh, to even, even I mean, today, kind of, you can already get a lot of insight from it. But what you need to have is this long time perspective, what you will over learn about time. over time, how yeah. much you will learn. Yeah. And, and you know, the, the pace of research uh, is accelerating. We discussed earlier kind of mm -hmm. age, age of biotech, genomics. Uh, so more and more, so essentially your genome will become more and more useful to you as the time progresses. Yeah, yeah, this, oh, 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 this, this added dimension of time is so important to, to, to put into the healthcare equation. Because if you're constantly observing your body uh, all your biometrics over time, you're able to predict pathologies developing, you're able to tackle them, you retain youthful homeostatic capacity, all these cool things that can enable you to be healthier, longer, more creative, experience more things. These are, these are very um, major pillars of the anti-aging community's drive and desire as well. And I love how you call it a blueprint. You know, it's like understanding yourself. Uh, and, and this is a very beautiful part of it. You know, for the last six million years of evolution, there was never a time that you could take the DNA and sequence it. And exactly. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, I gave those examples with you know chemistry, physics, and so on. And so far, it has been kind of more about understanding nature. And now we're at a point where we're actually understanding ourselves. And because of that, I think the current you know age of biotech can to us to us as you know humans humanity can be you know will be more impactful than uh, potentially than everything that came before it yeah yeah <laughs> i love it i love it okay let's um on the next slide that we have this was kind of another one of these big huge like moments for me when this the curve in terms of people that are partaking in getting their genetic sequenced is just it's going up so fast yeah and then the issue comes up like you've indicated earlier that people are hold what breaks what's happening with this data yeah are are am i owning it do you own it are you selling it is the government involved and so then there there's the breaks happened and now it's like let's think about this yeah yeah so yeah, as you said, you know, uh, the adoption is growing. More and more people are aware of the opportunity to get uh, genetic tests. So this curve actually not shows real sequencing data, but actually just genotyping data, which is you know, still a genetic test, but at much lower resolution. Uh, but still, the availability of genetic tests, uh, um, people are increasingly aware of it and use this opportunity to learn of those various things, like you know, health and ancestry, and you know, various, various traits. Um, and it's great that you know it has been an exponentially uh, growing space. The more data is generated, the better. It, you know, sharing data is also good. Uh, but questions, uh, as you said, you know, are now coming up. Is there enough transparency? Who is really making the decisions whether the data shared or not? And um, for one, there are just those concerns that have been created that deter many people from from getting any kind of genetic tests. And in addition to those concerns. There's an open question, are those risks real? Can, for example, someone be denied insurance based on genetics? Or can anything else bad happen if you know, we do not uh, you know, emphasize more and how important pr privacy of genetic data is and give people an opportunity to protect it? Yeah, and in that next slide is all of the crazy headlines as well of... Yeah, yeah this, this just illustrates that how much attention the space is getting. Um, I mean, so if you, you know, if you look at uh, what, what, you know, the age of internet has brought us. Uh, uses DNA to track people. Yeah. This type of stuff is, is <laughs> nuts. Our, our, our devices are already uh, give us the location data all the time. Can, yeah. You can, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so what people, I think, come to understand today is that there are 
many organizations that just like to track them, of, you know, to monetize <laughs> their data, whether it's you know Google, Facebook, and others. Yeah. Uh, often it's you know about uh, targeted advertising and things like that. Um, and then if they think uh, about what you know, what's the most personal data that I own? It's probably not my search history, but it's it's my DNA. And there are companies that might be interested in monetizing that. Then they get very very nervous about this. <laughs> and Headlines like that, there's just countless uh, headlines like that all over the internet. Uh, many yeah. articles being you know, written literally every day about, uh, about some personal genomics companies either being hacked or just kind of using the data in a way that, that people find concerning. Um, yeah, yeah, this is, this is nuts. And, yeah. You, yeah, and, yeah. And, 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 and as you said, you know, in addition to just as companies, there are also governments uh, getting involved yeah. increasingly. Um, uh, so the year 2018 was a year when uh, I think in the US in particular the law enforcement discovered how useful genomic databases oh can be. Oh my gosh, this point <laughs> is crazy. Yes, yeah. teach us. Um, which is, um, well, the basic idea there is that, you know, there are many unsolved crimes that m might have been committed decades ago. Um, so you have a crime, crime scene uh, and, you know, a sample that you found uh, uh, on that crime scene. So a biological sample from which you can extract a DNA that potentially belongs to, to the suspect. Uh, but how do you find that suspect with just a DNA in hand? You need some kind of a database to match it against. And today uh, we are at a point where we have tens of millions of people who got a genetic test. So as a, you know, law enforcement, uh, like you know, police or FBI, what you can do, you can take that sample, go to that database, try to match it against that database to either find that individual in that database because that individual got a test at some point, but that's not even necessary because it's already enough if just a distant relative of that individual got, a data got that test, so you get a partial match, you can connect with that relative and then through this collaboration of that relative, yeah. try to trace back the actual um, yeah, yeah. criminal. So the first famous case was, you know, the Golden State Killer in California um, that, that, that attracted a lot of attention. But since then, there were like really dozens of additional cases, uh, which is, you know, generally a good thing, right? When those decade-old cases are being solved and, you know, those murderers apprehended. Yes, yeah, but the problem is that the way that it's done uh, is uh, it's at costs of people's privacy. So the law enforcement just issues subpoenas to uh, personal genomics uh, companies, accesses the databases um, without really asking people for permission whether the data can be used. I think most people would kind of agree that you know they won't, won't, would want to help uh, apprehend the suspects, but this practice today you know lacks trans transparency and lacks um, lacks you know. It lacks the respect of people's privacy, like which which way is concerned, and there are of course other countries like uh, China, where uh, and you know s some other countries that are more authoritarian, um, where uh, genomic databases are used in, them in in much more concerning ways than, than they are today in the U.S. Just when you, when you're saying that that story, the third cousin can if they got sequenced that that how many how many more people does that basically bring into the genetic pool that didn't even didn't even say that they wanted to be sequenced yeah so, so there was an I believe a recent study in science uh, that showed that with the currently existing databases that uh, about you know 20 million people or so already 60 percent of the US population can essentially be identified indirectly by you know having just your cousin in the database so we are, uh, I guess, already at the yeah. point where it's kind of too late. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So that way, that 23 million is just U.S. No, that's is that world. Um, it's uh, it's um, it, it's globally, but the U.S. in terms of direct -to consumer genetics has been, um, you know, high, leading, high. dominating. Maybe um, like five million of those have been in the U.S. Or well, I think like maybe over 90 percent of them have been in the U.S. 90 percent of yeah. those. Okay, so then with 20 million, let's say, sequences, you can have, let's say, almost 100, if, if 70 million um, people be identified, yeah, let's say. Yeah, I mean, I think over half of the U.S. population, over yeah. 150 million people can be traced back. I mean, that's what the study says. Um, that's crazy. Yeah. And they didn't even opt into the system. Yeah, yeah that's, that's an interesting thing about DNA, right? For example, you share your DNA with your mother, with your father, with your siblings. So if you decide to take a test, 
uh, you're actually sharing their DNA yeah, without yeah, yeah, actually yeah, yeah. ever yeah. asking them. That's uh, crazy. And it, it adds a like, really an interesting kind of, kind of privacy consent aspect to anything involving yeah, involving yeah. genetic because your your DNA is not yours alone. You share it with a lot of people. Interesting. Yeah. So the consent question. <laughs> Like, who would have thought that you'd have to go ask your family if you could get your genome sequence? Yeah, I mean, you, today you don't have to. There's you know, no regulations that tell you you need to ask them before you yeah. get a genetic test. <laughs> so it's a gray area that so far has been not regulated um, in any way. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And then now, now okay, in the next... In the next couple, what is, what is that? What is that, Ronnie? You have like a whole big... Yeah, what it's... Is that? Um, my brother did uh, legacy tree genealogist, and he's real into, you know, where we're from. And Jonah did. Yeah. Interesting. I've yet to read this. I don't care. There's gonna be stuff in here that I don't like. I'm probably from some crazy people. <laughs> <laughs> you know. What was so, it called? Genealogy? Legacy, Legacy tree? tree. Genealogist. Genealogist. Oh, actually, I don't know this one. Interesting. Uh, but there, there are now many, many, many. personal genomics companies. Like Ancestry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Same yeah, thing, yeah. I would imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll, yeah, we're gonna break down the differences too. Um, Ron, let's go to the next slides too, because. I want to I wanna be explaining this with the visuals as we go. Um, you kind of broke this down already. We're understanding the disease. You can teach us, definitely teach us more. Well, actually, this would probably be a good time to explain the difference between um, what Ancestry and 23andMe do, um, which is, oh, you were teaching me earlier, there's, if there's six billion bases and that you have to get those individual data points that, 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 if you only get 500,000 of those, of those most, you can call it like a Pareto principle, like you're looking for the slots that have the highest chance of having a, a, a mutation that makes a disease happen. Yeah. And so there's a difference between doing it that way, which is what 23andMe and, and Ancestry do, versus your way, which is a whole genome, a, it's a low pass whole genome sequence. Yeah. And then how does that affect then the diseases, the drugs, trials? Right. Um, so, you know, the genetic data that is being generated and, you know, if it's being shared, it can um, uh, help advance, you know, just basic research, uh, helping just better understand human genetics, you know, our blueprints. And then that knowledge can use, be used, for example, for drug discovery, finding, for example, new correlations between a certain gene um, and a certain medical condition. Then you could after that, develop like a small molecule, a drug that will target that protein that's you know being produced from that gene, um, and that's kind of early stage of the drug discovery process. And then that e the genomic data can also be used at later stages. You know, for example, during clinical trials, um, where um, we have a problem today that the drug development costs keep increasing, uh, more more and more drugs are failing. Uh, and that's partially due to yeah. still our approach that we're pursuing that one drug fits all which is not necessarily true because we are different. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So how do we build drugs for that, that are personalized, that we know work for those you know, sp specific groups of people? And to do that, you need essentially to incorporate genomic data in your drug discovery pipelines and your clinical trials. To, uh, and, and, and if you do that, you can have you know, smaller clinical trials. Uh, you recruit only specific people who have you know, specific genetic, genetic uh, variants in their genome that you believe will be uh, Will, will respond uh, to the treatment, uh, and you will have higher ch success rates because of that. So this is essentially the path towards personalized medicine, where not just everyone gets prescribed the same drug, but based on your, your genetic background. Now, uh, the question that you brought up before, how is the data that we're generating different from the data that most other personal genomics companies are generating? Um, so we use this more novel technology called next generation DNA sequencing, which um, which essentially can be used to read almost all six billion pages, more than six billion pa bases in the human genome. Uh, what most other personal genomics companies are doing, they are essentially just getting a snapshot. They're reading out only about less than 0.1% of your whole genome. It's like, you know, it's like you read a book and you read only one letter every 10 pages, and then you try to figure out the rest. <laughs> so you can imagine that that's difficult and you miss a lot, while we are literally trying to read the whole book. Um, and uh, we are at a point in time where this is possible at an affordable uh, cost, 
because single letters are also very meaningful, which is why they, yeah. They yeah, yes. they are mainly meaningful. I mean, this yes. data that has been generated is useful, yes. but it, it, it has its limitations. Yes, yes. Um, and um, with next generation DNA sequencing, we can you know, essentially overcome um, those limitations. For example, in academic lab, next generation DNA sequencing has already completely replaced genotyping. It, it's genotyping is just not, not used anymore. Um, and wow. the same thing uh, will happen uh, I think most definitely in the direct-to-consumer market as well, because the prices just keep approaching uh, each other, and at some point it just won't make any sense anymore to just you know read the less than 0.1 percent of the genome. Maybe we can do the whole thing almost at the same cost, and we're getting to that point. Now, Dennis, let me ask you this: Then, if you, if when you're looking at the entire, um, almost the entire six billion bases, are you passing when you're doing this this low pass one time? Do you those 500,000 or so that, that have a, a high propensity for having a, a, a variation that causes um, uh, something bad, that do you, can, you, can you focus more of your attention on that to make sure you get the right uh, letter? Yeah, so this, this, this next generation DNA signature you can combine both, essentially random sampling of the whole genome at low coverage. Uh, but you can also focus more on certain genes that are of, of you know, kind of more importance. There's, for example, a set of 59 genes called SCMG59 that are, that are defined as being um, particularly important because if you find something in those genes, there's actually actionable steps you can take, for example, to prevent uh, uh, you know, getting sick or do we be able to receive a therapy. Uh, so we can, for example, do whole genome at low pass, um, at low coverage, from that, get your answers, to get a lot of you know, fun facts, but then focus on you know, a small subset of genes that are particularly important to get, um, to get you, you know, health-related information that might be very important to you. Um, and, but, but, but at the end of the day, this is just a, a, a temporary, I think, solution, because what you want to do in the end is really sequence the whole genome at high coverage. At high coverage. And that's, that's a product that will be launching soon. So to, today what you can buy, if you go to the Nebula website, is you know, this low pass whole genome sequencing, but it will start offering high coverage whole genome sequencing soon as well. Interesting, so you, you can actually get an action item even from the low pass, you can get an action item that you can maybe through a process of, of maybe exercise or nutrition or whatever it may be that you could um, slowly become less and less likely to develop a disease. Yeah. And that this type of is like this is big. This is a big part of the why for people is that you can um, take action with your blueprint and and um, and better uh, and live healthier throughout your life. Then. Yeah, this is going to be crazy when the high uh, resolution uh, yeah. whole so genomes Yeah, so we are coming. being a little bit careful with, you know, with the low pass sequencing, uh, when, especially when people try, when we give people the data and they try to extract health information from it, we tell them <laughs> this is only 99% accurate, so be careful if you find something, you know, uh, go to a physician to confirm it. Uh, or just wait for, for our high coverage sequencing product for which we'll be able to tell, you know, this 99.999% accuracy uh, whether, you know, you have a certain, uh, certain variant or not. Yes, yes, okay. And um, let's go to the next image, Ronnie. So, this is, this is really interesting. When you, when, when you were teaching me about this, I was thinking that there was a, a like a, like this is almost as though it's it's like shattering all of the data silos. That's what I love about Nebula. I love shattering data silos because in, it, across every single field um, of science, uh, the more that we can work on a transparent and open level, uh, the faster we can advance the edge of science. The more we can understand about ourselves, yeah. and and so okay. So you're when 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 I when I submit, you know, the link to Nebula Genomics is below. But when when I when I submit um, a payment, right now it's only like twenty bucks. Yeah. Right. It's only twenty bucks right now, and then I get your saliva kit, and then I submit. The, I'll submit my saliva to you, then you guys do low pass sequencing, and then you are working on how to anonymize that most effectively yeah. right now. So we are working on um, several complementary approaches to make sure that your privacy and your data are essentially protected throughout, uh, throughout the whole process. Um, 
so the first feature that we're working on right now is just making it anonymous, which means that we want to enable you to get sequenced, um, get the test, get the results, without us even knowing who you are. Uh, and, and this means that you should be able to pay for your sequencing anonymously, and you should be able to receive your saliva collection kit an anonymously and submit it to us without us knowing your name, your credit card number, your address, any identifiable information. Um, wow. So, so that's, that's you, when uh, you pay with cryptocurrency. That's, ex it, that's, what, that's one option, right? So <laughs> we, uh, um, that's the first step, right? You, you, you get the data is generated uh, anonymously. Then the second step is once the data is generated, how do we make sure that you are in control of your data? Um, and you know, you're the only one who can decide what happens to it. Um, there are several approaches there that we can take. For example, we can just encrypt it, give you the password, and you're essentially the only one who has an, be able to decrypt it. It has some disadvantages because as a user, if you lose password, your data is gone. We cannot reset your password if, yes. we, if, we, if we are unable to do that. An alternative is to split your password essentially in multiple pieces and get those pieces to multiple independent organizations, which can, for example, be nonprofit uh, groups that support biomedical research. So this way you distri distribute trust. There's no longer a single party that you need trust. Um, and uh, your data can be only decrypted and made accessible if there's you know, consent between those parties that you know, this use case is uh, you know, uh, warranted and the, the, the researcher who requesting access is, can, can be trusted. Uh, so for that, we use this you know, um, multi-party access control as I just described and blockchain to actually communicate permissions communicate consent so you can for example say I allow you know John Doe from that pharma company to use my data yes. add that entry to the blockchain and those multiple parties who hold the keys can read out this entry from the blockchain see that you gave the permission then decrypt your data and give permission to the John Doe from from the pharma company very um, interesting that's so you you have these are like valves yeah. that you get to control the the flow of your of your uh, genomic data for for research. Yeah, yeah. So that's the second step, essentially enabling controllability and transparency, which you know blockchain helps us uh, accomplish both. And then the third step is that once you decided to share your data with that researcher, how do you make sure that it's not misused? Um, and there are several approaches there as well. So the most basic one is just instead of giving your data to that researcher, you bring the computations to the data. So essentially ask the researcher, what do you want to compute? Uh, give us your, your algorithms. We will run them uh, ourselves on that data and return you only the results. Wow. Uh, so that's you know, the most basic way to, uh, to protect the data privacy. And it can be uh, supplemented by some additional technologies. For example, today, most of those computations happen in clouds, right? Like you know, Google Cloud, AWS, mm -hmm. and then the question might come up, how do you make sure you trust Google and you trust Amazon? Uh, because they are the ones storing the data and computing on the data. Um, and to address that issue, uh, some other technologies can be used. One of them, um, well, which are generally called essentially privacy preserving technologies. And at the core uh, of those technologies, the idea of computing on encrypted data. Actually, uh, having data in an encrypted form, never actually decrypting it. So, you know, the cloud storage provider can actually never see the data, but still a query or a, or a pipeline can be executed on the data. Some result can be generated, which is also encrypted and also not visible to the storage and computing provider. Wow. And the uh, encrypted result mm -hmm. can be then shared with the researcher and the researcher is able to decrypt the result and, you know, see uh, what he wanted to find out. And through the process, essentially no one has seen the data. You have a ton of possible possibilities to explore here. You yeah. may even go with multiple ways of. Yeah, that's an important point because all of those things are complementary. It's 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 they they not replace each other. You know, this first one enables anonymity. Then blockchain is about transparency and control, and the third one is about actually protecting privacy of shared data. Yeah. Uh, and you know, an ideal system will be combining all of them. Yeah. Yeah. Whoa. It's so interesting hearing you talk about all of the different ways that this can be done. I love it. I love it. And, and it's very exciting to think about what the, like kind of what the iterations are going to be like with, with, this, with this anonymity, control, and security, um, all of these components. Okay, um, let's go uh, to the next one. Now, this is again. This is one of the you know that was one of the the, the highest privacy the highest concern was privacy for people not um, doing the um, getting involved in testing. This image 
is extremely interesting to me because I am so excited about learning about what people are actually doing with the data. Like, I'm just thinking about these devices that we use all the time, but we have no idea how the data is really being used. The closest you get is like your GPS, you get to know when there's traffic on the road. That's because people are sharing the data and you've learned that, yeah. right? But this is so cool because I can actually learn what research is being done using my biometrics yeah. and then I can engage with the researchers and it becomes like a whole learning. I love learning, right? So this becomes a whole learning and engagement process with science. Yeah, 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 that's an important point. I mean, all those technologies they described on, on, on the previous slide, additional challenge is really how do you explain them to the users? How do you make the user understand and trust that those technology will protect uh, you know, your, your, your genomic data? So the challenge is not only implementing the technology, but actually translating them into a, as, as I call it, transparency-centered user experience. And this slide just shows uh, how our UI looks like, where you know, researchers can communicate uh, r relatively directly with, you know, with different uh, individuals on the platform who can remain anonymous through the process, uh, but then you know, learn about who is talking with them, uh, you know, who the researcher is, where he works, what he wants to use the data for, and then you know, consent or not consent for the data to be used for that particular purpose. And a as you mentioned correctly, it's not just about kind of one way, just the researcher communicating with the, uh, with the individual, but after the data is being shared and some study is done, uh, so that the individuals actually receive some feedback and can, you know, can learn about what was accomplished with their help. Uh, and we think that really engaging that people uh, this way is re really important to make them participate in research and creating such a much more consumer or patient-centric platform is, 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 uh, is a core, core approach to, to, to accomplishing this. Yeah, and it even potentially goes into the sphere of the more that you uh, give your, open your valves and let the, the data flow for research, the more that you can potentially earn. You can potentially earn these credits on yeah. your platform. Yeah, teach us about the credit system. Yeah, it's, it's actually quite interesting. Uh, so this option exists. Uh, people can, can earn uh, if, if they wish to. Uh, we did a survey and actually found out that many people are willing to share the data for purely altruistic reasons. That's simply, so simply because they, you know, they want to help researchers, they want to help find cures yes. for, for diseases, yes. but they want to stay in control of the data. They, want, they do not want to disappear in a black hole and then don't know what happens <laughs> with it. Uh, so they want full control, full transparency, and then I think there's you know, a high level of altruism. Um, and, but yes, this option exists, and I think some people will take this option, especially if they are in contact with you know, pharma companies uh, and then you know, get, get actually asked to be paid uh, for, for giving access to the data. Um, and uh, for that, we use you know, our credit system, which, uh, which uh, you know, are based on, on, a, on our cryptocurrency, on, on our blockchain, that can be you know, transferred between, uh, between those researchers uh, and the individuals. And the people who earn those credits can then um, use them to purchase uh, various things uh, on our platform. Um, so for example, even today, if you already go to nebula.org, register, um, you can earn credits by just answering basic service about your health and you can inf and doing other things, like for example, referring friends. And you can in fact today earn enough credits to get free low pass whole genome sequencing. Yeah. And over time, there will be you know, more things added that you can just buy with the earned credits, um, which can be you know, additional analytics or you know, it can even think as you know, gift cards that you can just you know, take to Amazon or some whatever platform and then you just buy something for with it. Um, yep. Yeah. It's, it's also great to hear that there's a, the altruistic component is, is coming up that the people are like, I don't need the credits, just, yeah. you know, just get the scientific research done that yeah. needs to be done to help. I think that that's yeah. a very important point. You know, when, 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 when kind of new stories about you know, a pharma company buying a lot of genomic data, there's kind of a lot of backlash against this. It's not about people do not want to, uh, the data to be used for research. It's about no, that nobody asks them. That it happens in an intransparent way and they don't know what's going on. Uh, so that's a core issue that needs to be addressed. And then I think many people will be you know, gladly willing to share the data with academic or you know, industry researchers. And the inclusive stakeholding too, that, that if, if, you, if, you can, if you at least give the people the option and say, hey, we're already making 
20 million dollars on this data set being purchased for use in testing would you like a tiny little cut because you know of this of this amount of money uh, just like you know yeah. looping people in as inclusive stakeholders yeah and you know in our case it you know it won't be a tiny little cut guys we uh we plan to give you know the users uh the largest uh, sh uh, portion of you know whatever the pharma company is paying uh, to get access. So we we not we, we ourselves not you know s we are, what's important is we are not in the business of taking ownership of that data. We are rather creating the infrastructure Correct. to enable the researchers to access a network of people, uh, and then they can ask those people whether they can have access to their data. So uh, we will charge pharma companies for giving them access to that network, but the pharma companies will not actually pay the individual users for getting access to the data. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a big uh, ethical stance that you take, and we we love that a lot. That's very very powerful. Um, if we can get more people realizing that that these ideas are coming through them to provide the idea to the world, and not for them to earn material in the in the world, that 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 I think we'll have a better society from that. Dennis, I want to know what's your. Um, you know the the last slide that we have is is your team, and you know uh, as you said earlier, you and Kamal, uh, as well as George, are doing the the, the co-founding of, of Nebula. How big is the team now? With with besides you three, how large is the team? I think we are fourteen people right now. Fourteen. Yeah. Yeah, that's a big team already. Yeah. Yeah, we have yeah. been growing quickly. That's awesome. That's so good to hear. Um, and in just yeah, in just two years since conception to now, that's that's awesome. Um, I want to know what do you, how do you feel about the these like ethical considerations that are happening around uh, you? Obviously, very much you know so you, privacy, privacy, of course, of course. But at the same time, this is kind of like <clears throat> like synthetic biology is another one of these explosive fields like artificial intelligence and, and neuroscience that is that has malevolent actors can gain lots of power in the in the field so how do you how do you feel about our ability to like fend that off and how can we do that best well in terms of genomic data and I think health data in general there's a trend right now to make uh, the individuals uh, you know the owners of their own data and the controllers of their own data and I think that's a very good trend from which not only the people themselves will, will uh, are benefit, uh, but actually uh, kind of legitimate users who, who uh, researchers um, in, in academia or industry who want to get access to that data, because for them it's also much better to get access to an individual and to be able to generate data on demand rather than you know get access to kind of a static data set that was kind of obtained in shady ways. Uh, and a user is much more valuable than just such a static piece of data. Um, so it's a trend, uh, I think, that is good for everyone. Um, it's good, you know, for privacy. Uh, it's good also for just facilitating research and, you know, getting people more engaged. Um, and it's only not good for people who, or entities who would like to, you know, take, uh, take you know, people's data and then just monetize it for their own gain in, you know, often very intransparent yeah. and, and uh, not ethical ways. And then doesn't it, doesn't part of like the whole movement towards transparency, like, like sometimes I envision a, a very, you know, spiritually actualized and awakened world where there aren't these malevolences and then you can be radically transparent, like your data can live even without potentially being anonymized. Is that like an imaginative future that you can also think is, is, uh, is it possible? Yeah, I mean, that's an open question, right? So we have been talking about possible risks, uh, like, you know, governments using the data, the risk of discrimination, like, for example, by insurance companies. The question is, are those risks real? Will there be, you know, people affected in the future uh, by that if we don't implement, uh, you know, different privacy protection mechanisms yeah. or not? Um, and people feel in different ways about that. Um, there's, for example, another project uh, also started by George. It's called Personal Genome Project. And there it's all about transparency. It's also a genomics project, essentially. And people who participate in that, they make the genomes essentially public on the internet. Yeah. Uh, and for free to use for, for everyone without any uh, That's re restrictions. So interesting. And some, some people are, you know, fine with that. They, they, they are not worried. And maybe they're right. Maybe the, the, we, are, we are overestimating the risks. We don't know. Yeah. But um, what I was thinking is that we need 
to be able to address the concerns. F otherwise, that just the progress will be hindered right. uh, because yeah. uh, and people are concerned. That ju ju just a matter of fact. And to get them more engaged in research, to me, to in to, in to convince them to share the data, uh, we do need to address those concerns. Otherwise, research will just end and yeah. progress will stagnate. Yeah. This is a good to see the contrasting the personal genome project with yeah. nebula genomics. Yeah. yeah, which is which are both you know. Uh, good projects and just yes, yes. addressing different audiences. Correct. Great. And yeah. that way the scientific progress can just keep moving. Yeah, exactly. Yes, yes. Now, um, what would be a, a something that, you know, going into the exponential age, AI age, that you would recommend children to learn, that you would recommend parents to teach kids, parents to learn themselves as well? <sighs> That's a good question. Um, uh, to me personally, it has been very helpful uh, to um, to have, I would say, even if not deep knowledge, but at least some understanding of of uh, different fields. So in my case, it's you know it's it's yeah. genomics, uh, but on the other hand, you know it's computer science. Uh, over the past couple of years, it's become you know cryptography increasingly, yeah. and that just enables you to just bring things together in a way that. Uh, most people are not able to, and by doing that, you can um, you can um, you know address previously uh, unsolved issues. I, I just spoke a few days with someone who uh, who you know was I believe interviewing some you know really famous no Nobel Prize winning physicists and you know, really smart people, but then found that they just don't understand you know basics of biology, like how how some very basic things work, and that you know that person told me like I was so surprised. How can they possibly not know things people learn in high school? Those guys you know won you know prizes you know Nobel prizes in physics, um, and we, we can't know it all. <laughs> if you knew everything, you'd be the most hated person <laughs> in the world. Yeah, but that's why we all have to work <laughs> together. We have to respect each other's individual intelligence and bring it all together. Otherwise, we're doomed. This is a very <laughs> interesting point about you know how a Nobel Prize laureate um, may not know a high school level in a different field. This he you know the multidisciplinary a perspective having your lens that you see the world with multiple disciplines is so crucial. I love how you said that. And if we can, you know, put that into into play in this exponential technology age, I think. Yeah. We'll, yeah. yeah. So, so to answer your question more briefly and directly, I think it's very beneficial to have a relatively shallow knowledge, but knowledge of you know different areas. And what can that can the way you can, for example, accomplish that is you know talking with people from from different fields. Uh, you know, as, as a physicist, talk with b b b biologists and talk yes. with chemists. Yes. Uh, have you know basic understanding what's going on in those areas, and sometimes you will really come across something to which maybe you can apply your knowledge in your in your field that you're an expert on to solve a previously uh, that's right. problem that those people right. in those other fields have not been able to address before. The the creative. Uh, uh, it helps so much with new creative thinking and out of the box thinking. People in one industry thinking a certain way, someone from a different industry comes in and says, hey, have you thought about it this way? Exactly. Boom. This is very beautiful stuff. Dennis, some questions at the end of the show are simulation questions. Let's ask you, first question, are we alone in the cosmos? <laughs> well, I mean, um, I read about, you know, you know, what's the name of this paradox? Fer called? Fermi paradox? Yeah, Fermi paradox that, you know, it's, it's uh, statistically very improbable that we are alone. Uh, there are probably some issues why, you know, no, nobody ever contacted us. The distance may be one. Uh, maybe someone's watching us and we just don't know. So, so wh who knows? Um, uh, it would certainly be very exciting if we found out one day. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And how about show simulation? So we'll ask you, are we in a simulation? Oh, that's even, that's even crazy. <laughs> um, I would like to believe that we are not. <laughs> um, I, I, <laughs> I, 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 I mean, if it is a simulation, it's a really good simulation. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no one has so far been, you know, be able to peak 
uh, take a look past, uh, past, you know, uh, past, you know the code that is running. Yeah. Yeah. Ron's, Ron's like, you know, pierced the not barrel. as good as... See, uh, see, see the arrows yeah. in the matrix. Yeah. You can see the arrows in the matrix, Ron. Yeah. <laughs> it's a secret. <laughs> I'm not supposed to talk about it. I see them. Dirty rat bastards. <laughs> It's a pretty good simulation. <laughs> it's a pretty good one. Uh, that's good. Hopefully, you know, with science, science is such a cool tool that if we can probe at the, at the simulation and test, that'd be very interesting. And the last question we ask on the show is, what is the most beautiful thing in the world? Well, I don't know what is the most beautiful thing in the world, but I can tell you something that is very beautiful from you know, a scientist's perspective. Um, I think when you have, you're trying to solve a problem and you, know, you have a hypothesis that you kind of start, start doing your research based on, and so you, do, you do really a set of experiments and validate that hypothesis step by step, and then in the end you discover something novel, and then, you know, that's so beautiful, and you feel like you advanced human knowledge by you know a little bit and you know that makes one uh, very happy and you know I think that's one beautiful thing yes yes you're adding to the foundation of collective learning and uh, with obje objectively and this is very important with with reproducibility it's very important we had a one of our previous guests was explaining it like you have a, a, a you're on a big big beach with sand and then what you do is you add one cup of sand to the to the beach, and I was like, "Oh my gosh, that's a lot of work for one cup of adding one cup of sand to the beach." Yeah, <laughs> some some ideas are breakthrough though. Like whoever Satoshi Nakamoto and blockchain technology is has been, you know, a, maybe a truckload of sand on yeah. the beach potentially. So. Yeah, I mean it's a trade off, right? If you know if you lived like a few thousand years ago, the beach was pretty small back then. It was yes. easy to add a lot yes, to it. Yes, yes, yes. Today it's much harder. Uh, but the advantage is that we you know just live in a in a better world and you know benefit from all that science that was added to the beach. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They keep the only only the highest signal and least amount of noise on on the on the foundation of knowledge. Dennis, we love your work very much. This has been such an honor. Thank you for coming on to our show. It was my pleasure. Thank you. We're very appreciative. Keep up the great work. Thanks. We're all counting on you. I will do my best. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's great that your team's so big now and that you're doing this work. Everyone, check out the links below. We would love for you to check out Nebula Genomics. Also, go and have more conversations with people about what it's like to have your personal blueprint sequence so you can better understand it and so that we can contribute to this foundation of collective knowledge. Talk to your family, your friends, your communities, get more people talking about this, about the biotech explosion. Huge shout out to Ron Vargas, our producer and director. Much love, thank you very much. And support the artists and entrepreneurs that you believe in. Nebula's links are below, simulation, our links are below. Support us, help us grow. We would love to have you more involved in our community. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you so much, we will see you soon. Peace. Thank you. Thank you.